This video is an interview with the inventor of surfing small gliders on waves of air, but first an introduction. It's said that there's nothing new under the sun, but the first time I saw someone levitating a glider, I was dumbstruck. The person was Dr. Tyler McCready on the program Scientific American Frontiers, demonstrating to host Alan Alda, who was also wowed. I've never seen anything like that. Ten years later, I was building and flying walk-along gliders with my students. I was asked to demonstrate and teach with some walk-along flying innovators at the St. Louis Science Center. It was a long shot, but why not ask the inventor of walk-along gliding to join us? We were thrilled when he came. Tyler showed museum visitors how to fly. He shared how walk-along gliders came to be, how he manufactured and sold them. He also talked about his remarkable family. Though I never met his father, starting the year I graduated from high school, I started learning of Dr. Paul McCready's activities, the creative, almost playful things he was doing with science and technology, inspired me so much it helped me decide what to do with my life. Sure, I'm Tyler McCready, uh, the son of Paul McCready, who's the father of human-powered flight. Um, he started a company called Aerovironment that makes uh, has a long history of making a lot of one-of-kind airplanes and I work at that company now um, building prototypes trying for uh, we're actually working on ocean projects trying to get the company to start looking into the ocean so ocean wave power and ocean current power and unmanned ocean vehicles and, and back with the human powered flight I was the test pilot for our first human powered airplane because my father needed somebody who was very lightweight and I was only 14 at the time and so he needed someone very lightweight who was uh, you know available to work and who knew how to fly and I knew how to fly because he had had us flying hang gliders from when I was 10 years old. My father used to be a world champion sailplane pilot and he stopped flying around when he started having kids but he knew, knew a lot of people who were into flying. In 1971, there was a little sort of thing prop to get together people who decided to sort of build their own hang gliders. The sport really didn't exist prior to that, but some people had sort of put out some plans, people kind of got together, they said, hey, you know, we can do this. So by, by 1972, when I was 10 years old, um, we had built our first hang glider. We, you know, we bought some plans for $25, bought a bunch of bamboo and plastic, black plastic sheet and uh, tape and wire and, and built a hang glider and would go out to the beach to sand dunes to fly, which is great because the glider was basically uncontrollable, but you can crash in the sand. And when you're 10 years old, you can crash anywhere and survive it. My brother, who's two or two and a half years older than, than I am, he was also flying. And so the sport of hang gliding was developing at that time from the, from the triangle-shaped gliders to the more slender, higher performance gliders that, that we have today. You know, it was funny, we were, we were like these little kids in amongst, um, it, was, it was kind of a bunch of hippies in the hang gliding, hang gliding crowd, I guess mostly in their 20s, and not, you know, and ultimately not all that many people hang gliding. So we were able to participate in a lot of the early development of that sport. Ever since we were little kids, we were building model airplanes and paper airplanes and doing a lot of flying and then got um, involved in hang gliding. We started making a lot of paper airplanes that looked like hang gliders and doing a lot of um, slope flying where there's, as the wind goes up a slope, it makes an up current and we'd fly our we just go down to a local hillside and fly our paper airplanes because it, you could get flights for a minute or more and sometimes with you know just the right design it almost seemed like the plane would would go back and forth all on its own and sometimes catch a thermal and even fly away you know, we had a great time flying our planes in lift and between my my older brother and I and various friends we you know, we get competitive about who can make the best plane, who can get the longest flight on the slope, who can make a plane that's going to fly, um, fly at the, the flattest glide angle. And, and I remember that my older brother and I, we, you know, we were particularly um, 
competitive with this at home. And we're flying, had, had a, a good space between the couches and the living room and could fly our paper, paper airplanes, glide them from one side and see how far they would go across the living room. And as we made them better and better, we got them to um, you know, hit the wall on the other side of the living room. And we'd see how high could we each get our plane to hit the wall. And, and eventually realized that if the goal is just to hit the wall as high as possible on the other side with, a, you know, with your gliding plane, not just crumpling and throwing a piece of paper, although that would, that would win that you could launch the plane and then run around the couch and just before the plane hits the wall, give it a little swoop of air and, you know, and sort of kick it up and it would hit the wall a, a foot higher and say, I won. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and we started looking into other ways of, you know, how can we get that plane to hit the wall higher um, on the other side? and eventually realized that we could follow the airplane all the way across the living room with a board underneath it um, making an up current just like the slope lift that we had been flying in outside we could create our own lift and fly the planes around and keep them up as long as we followed around behind them with a board this was it um, I guess my father has it written down that I was about 13 at the time and my older brother would have been 15 it was right around then that we started working on um, our first human-powered plane. There was a, a large cash prize, um, $100,000, for doing a one-mile figure-eight course. It was intriguing to my father because the prize had been around for 18 years and no one had achieved it, even though people had spent a lot of money on it, done some incredible engineering, made really amazing airplanes, but they couldn't make it around this course. And my father came up with an idea that costs almost nothing, you know, just some aluminum tubes, plastic sheet, you know, almost like our first hang glider. Um, a lot of wires, tape, string. There's a little bit more than that, but basically it was a very crude airplane, especially through all our prototyping stages. But it, it was based on a fundamentally different approach. The key to his success was that he didn't do things the way everybody else was doing them. But while we were working on that, we had a lot of time to spend out at a very lonely airport in a big empty hangar waiting for the wind to die down so that we could fly our human-powered plane. We had a lot of very lightweight material to work with and you know all the scissors and tape and everything that we could want. A bunch of people around who knew about aerodynamics. And so we started building a whole lot of different, what we call the walk-along glider, because you walk along behind it to keep it up in the air. Seeing how slowly could we make them fly, how maneuverable could we make them, make fast ones to fly out outside in the wind. Normally they, they don't handle turbulence very well when they fly very slowly. But we'd make you know, outdoor versions, indoor versions, really big ones, really, really itty bitty little ones. 